In this uh, second video of this section, we're going to move on to hierarchical clustering approaches. Now, in contrast to k-means that we covered in our last video, the number of clusters here with hierarchical clustering does not need to be specified beforehand, and this is obviously a big plus. So there are two main kinds of hierarchical clustering you'll hear mentioned in, in the literature and in general approaches, so-called bottom-up and top-down. And these approaches are actually rather similar, and if you understand one, you'll pretty much understand the other. We'll focus on bottom-up, which is the more popular of the two approaches. It's typically the, the default one for these algorithms that we'll use, and it's the one we'll most often see. So we're going to start there. So with bottom-up, we start at the bottom with each data point considered an initially it's a cluster on its own. So for example, here in the, in the graphic behind me, I have five data points, and we're gonna start at the bottom with each of these five points as its own initial cluster. We're gonna say we've got five clusters, and as many clusters as we have data points. And then we're gonna go up and group these things together, or merge them or link them as we go through to reveal some kind of structure in our data. So we go through in the sequential process by merging or linking these pre-existing clusters together based on their closeness or their uh, smallest dissimilarity, if you will. So here, what we'll do first is we'll group this uh, yellow and purple into uh, one new cluster. So overall, we now have four clusters. You know, we had five to begin with with our five data points. We've grouped two together. So now we say we have four clusters at the current stage. We then go through and group the next uh, two points, in this case the green and the brown here, and now we have three uh, clusters at, at this step. And then we link these two, we link the blue in with the pre-existing yellow and purple here cluster to have two overall clusters. And then finally we, we arrive at the top when everything is now in one final cluster. So that's our bottom up to, to the top approach. So to do this in R, we can use the main uh, BSR function hclust. It will take as input, uh, not your data matrix or data frame as with the case with k-means that we saw earlier, but rather a pre-calculated distance or dissimilarity matrix. You can get this most commonly with a method uh, such as dist for distance matrix calculation, which calculates by default standard Euclidean distance, although we could use any measure of distance similarity, such as you know, sequence similarity or RMSD, root mean squared distance, if it was protein structures, or any other method of, of measuring the distance between your data. And that will be given as a, as a square matrix, as input to the hclust function. And then we run hclust, and it'll give you an object. And unfortunately, the print method for hclust, it's not as useful as the one we would have saw for k-means, if you went through that example. You know, the k-means, if you just print the result of k-means, it'll tell you lots of useful information like the cluster membership vector and, and the centroids and, and various other useful things about uh, about your results. But here with uh, hclust, it basically just prints out, you know, you know, details of how the calculation was set up, that, you know, you had 60 points in it and that it was using Euclidean distance and etc. So not a very useful print method. But there is a really nice plot method for the hclust class objects that, that are returned from the hclust function. It generates a so-called uh, dendrogram, basically a little tree-like structure here that I'm, that I'm showing. And we'll look at one of these in, in more detail in a moment. Uh, so, so let's first, before we delve into them, figure out where this kind of tree comes from. Because it summarizes, actually not summarizes, it displays the results of this hierarchical clustering approach. Where does the tree come from? Well, let's return to the, the bottom, you know, with our five points, we'll start at the bottom again. And I'm showing here, in addition to the, the points in our 2D plane, I'm showing the tree that's going to build up here on the right. So, again, we merge points or clusters to form new clusters in this approach. So here, for example, at a certain distance from each other, the purple and the yellow points can be linked. So in our dendrogram or our tree, we draw this first linking bar of the tree, you know, it looks a bit like a soccer goalpost here where the height of that crossbar, that's the important thing, it's the height of that crossbar being the distance at which these points were linked together, which they were joined. And then we do the next uh, merge or linkage here. Uh, so here it's the brown and the green points and they were, uh, uh, were further from each other from those first two purple and yellow points. So again, the crossbar here is going to be a little higher uh, in our dendrogram feature, and that's that's shown here. You know, so it's a larger goals, if if you will. And then we have a third linkage or merge, 
where we're, we link the blue point into the previously linked purple and yellow here to yield two clusters overall. Again, we draw our, our goals here, our, our crossbar and linkage. And then finally, we arrive at the, the top where everything's in one in one cluster and we draw our, our, our goals, our crossbar for this and for our all-in-one cluster, if you will. So this yields our final clustering result and the resulting uh, dendrogram figure. So really, it's the height of the crossbar or, or you know, the proper football goalposts that we were talking about that we really want to pay attention to primarily with these dendrogram figures. That's the important information that's being conveyed, the relative heights of these different goals of these crossbars. Okay, so we can draw these in R by just calling the base R plot function. And because the result of, of each cluster has got a class to it, plot has a method that will know what to do to plot it properly, not as a scatter plot or some other bar plot or something, it'll just plot it as a tree. Okay, so we just call plot on HC, that was our resulting object from running each cluster and our distance matrix, and it'll make the tree. We can just for visualization purposes draw a line across the tree here. I'm using the ab line function here and I'm telling it please draw it at a height of six and please color it red just for easy viewing here. And the reason I'm doing this is because if we consider like cutting across the tree at this point where I drew that red line, it, you'll be left with you know what's attached to those main branches, those dangling branches that we have just cut off. We'll have two main branches and all the leaves that are attached to those branches, those are the data points that'll be considered within a given cluster, within these two clusters here, if we cut at this point. We can actually do this cutting to find out what points are in each cluster with the cut tree function, C-U-T-R-E-E. -E. And what this will take is your, your, your uh, each cluster object, so the HC here, and a height at which to cut. Okay, and what this will return is a cluster membership vector with an element for each point in your original data set. And then the numbers in each element of that vector will indicate which cluster it belongs to. Uh, if you cut at that height that you specified. So in this case, for example, we would have a vector of length five because we had five points in our original uh, data set. And it would tell you one, 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 so three ones, which means that the first three points are in cluster one. And then it would be two, two for the last two points are in cluster two. So that membership vector, just like the one we would see from k-means, that's returned with the, the object that's returned from the k-means function, you can get here for each cluster by using the cut tree function. Now, figuring out what's a good height to cut at if we go between those two can often be tricky, especially when you have larger data sets to analyze and more complicated looking trees. So you can optionally tell each cluster just cut at a given k group. What this will do is it will go off and cut the tree appropriately to yield that many clusters, many, many k groups. So for example, I'm saying k equals two here. And that's going to return exactly the same result as we saw if we said h equals six, if we cut at the height equals six, it'll cut it appropriately for us here. And that's often a, an easier way once we've viewed the dendrogram to cut it. So as we've uh, reviewed, you know, each cluster proceeds kind of linking clusters progressively in order of their distance apart or their dissimilarity. And we kind of have a choice here when we do this. Basically, you know, how do we determine their dissimilarity? That is, you know, how do we determine their distance once you've got multiple points in a cluster? So here I'm listing out some of the main methods. You know, there are four kind of main methods. There are, there are quite a few others, but the complete linkage uh, method that's, that's going to use, it's going to calculate the similarities between all the points in one cluster and all the points in the second cluster. Then of all those distances, essentially, or, or, or similarities, it's going to use the largest one. Okay, that's complete linkage. Single link linkage uh, does the same thing. It calculates all those, those pairwise uh, similarities, but then it's going to use the smallest distance, not the largest one. With complete linkage, single is the, is the smallest. And then average, it's the same kind of deal as before, but it'll use the average of all those distances. So we've got three kind of choices here that will use all these pairwise distances between points in the two clusters. And then there's a third, or sorry, a fourth major kind of method called centroid that's very popular. But this one does often is it, um, uh, it'll, it'll calculate the center point of a given cluster, the centroid of a cluster in geometric terms, and measure the distance between that centroid and the centroid of another grouping of points, another cluster, and use that as the dissimilarity measure when we do our linkage. 
So visually, it's probably easier to understand this. Here I'm showing just three of them for, for clarity purposes. So single, it's going to take the smallest distance or dissimilarity between these points in these two different clusters when it goes to link them. Complete in the middle here will take the largest. And average is going to take the, the mean of all those distances here. And then centroid, what's not shown again, this is going to take the centroid point or the center point of each cluster and a distance between those. Now, because we're using uh, different values, the, the trees that you get or the dendrograms you get out are going to look kind of different because you're using actually different heights when you when you draw these crossbars here. So here in these two figures, I'm comparing complete uh, clustering linkage method and average linkage clustering method. You can specify this when you call the each cluster method. You can you can argue with it to use one or the other by setting the method. And the, the trees look different, right? So the, the branching is slightly different here. However, the clustering result, you know, if we split these into, you know, clearly there's two main groups here, uh, by where the goalposts are the largest, the largest goalpost here is between these two main sections here. It's going to be exactly the same result, whether we use either of these two methods, right? So our result is robust to our choice of linkage method. And this is a good thing. We often want, you know, our main conclusions that we're going to draw about our data to be robust to the choice of these different methods that we'll use. Here's an example of using the single linkage uh, uh, method. And again, we see kind of two main groups or two main sides to this, this tree. Here's the results of using centroid. Uh, and now folks often don't like these sort of dendrograms uh, because of this kind of peculiar crossbar heights that are shown here where they have drawn the red rectangles here. We see this kind of peculiar branching pattern or crossbars. And that's because, uh, you know, again, the centroid can move as you add new points to a, to a cluster. Now, technically, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, there's nothing wrong with the clustering. It's, it's, it's correct. It's just not maybe visually appealing, but the results are valid. And again, we see two main kind of sides and two main clusters that you might want to draw away or the main conclusion that you would want to draw away from this result is robust to the different methods. So in R, as I mentioned, we just argue with the each cluster function. We set the optional parameter, which has a default method. We can change it uh, to the different functions, like complete or average or, or single, etc. And uh, we'll do quite a bit of this in our hands-on section. I'll encourage you to explore uh, different ones and see how robust our results are to using different methods in this case. So we'll leave it there for now. In our next video in this section, we're going to delve into multivariate methods. Uh, we're going to start with principal component analysis, an extremely useful approach that's very uh, important and, and widely used. It's a kind of classic approach and it's very good for framing our mental model of how all these approaches work and the kind of objectives that we hope to get out of them. We'll also mention TSNI and UMAP and other common approaches that we use in, in mathematics. So I'll, I'll see you then and uh, thanks for your attention.